Wicked Man by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle One summer night, a few months after my marriage, I was seated by my own hearth, smoking a last pipe and nodding over a novel, for my day's work had been an exhausting one. My wife had already gone upstairs, and the sound of the locking of the hall door some time before told me that the servants had also retired. I had risen from my seat and was knocking out the ashes of my pipe, when I suddenly heard the clang of the bell. I looked at the clock. It was a quarter to twelve. This could not be a visitor at so late an hour. A patient, evidently, and possibly an all-night sitting. With a wry face I went out into the hall and opened the door. To my astonishment it was Sherlock Holmes who stood upon my step. "'Ah, Watson,' said he, "'I hope that I might not be too late to catch you.' "'My dear fellow, pray come in.' "'You look surprised, and no wonder. Relieved, too, I fancy. Huh, "'You still smoke the Arcadia mixture of your bachelor days, then. "'There's no mistaking that fluffy ash upon your coat. "'It's easy to tell that you have been accustomed to wear a uniform, Watson. "'You'll never pass as a purebred civilian as long as you keep that habit of carrying your handkerchief in your sleeve. "'Could you put me up tonight?' "'With pleasure. "'You told me that you had bachelor quarters for one, "'and I see that you have no gentleman visitor at present.' Your hat-stand proclaims as much. I shall be delighted if you will stay. Thank you. I'll fill the vacant peg, then. Sorry to see that you've had the British workman in the house. He's a token of evil, not the drains, I hope. No, the gas. Ah, he's left two nail marks from his boot upon your linoleum, just where the light strikes it. No, thank you. I had some supper at Waterloo, but I'll smoke a pipe with you with pleasure. I handed him my pouch, and he seated himself opposite to me, and smoked for some time in silence. I was well aware that nothing but business of importance would have brought him to me at such an hour, so I waited patiently until he should come round to it. "'I see that you are professionally rather busy just now,' said he, glancing very keenly across at me. "'Yes, I've had a busy day,' I answered. "'It may seem very foolish in your eyes,' I added. "'But really, I don't know how you deduced it.' Holmes chuckled to himself. "'I have the advantage of knowing your habits, my dear Watson,' said he. "'When your round is a short one, you walk, and when it is a long one, you use a hansom. As I perceive that your boots, although used, are by no means dirty, I cannot doubt that you are at present busy enough to justify the hansom.' "'Excellent,' I cried. "'Elementary,' said he. "'It is one of those instances where the reasoner can produce an effect which seems remarkable to his neighbour, because the latter has missed the one little point which is the basis of the deduction.' The same may be said, my dear fellow, for the effect of some of these little sketches of yours, which is entirely meretricious, depending as it does upon your retaining in your own hands, some factors in the problem which are never imparted to the reader. Now, at present I am in the position of these same readers, for I hold in this hand several threads of one of the strangest cases which ever perplexed a man's brain, and yet I lack the one or two which are needed to complete my theory. But I'll have them, Watson, I'll have them. His eyes kindled, and a slight flush sprang into his thin cheeks, for an instant only. When I glanced again, his face had resumed that red Indian composure, which had made so many regard him as a machine rather than a man. "'The problem presents features of interest,' said he. "'I may even say exceptional features of interest. I've already looked into the matter, and have come, as I think, within sight of my solution. If you could accompany me in that last step, you might be of considerable service to me.' I should be delighted. Could you go as far as Aldershot tomorrow? I have no doubt Jackson would take my practice. Very good. I want to start by the 11.10 from Waterloo. That would give me time. Then, if you are not too sleepy, I will give you a sketch of what has happened and of what remains to be done. I was sleepy before you came. I am quite wakeful now. I will compress the story as far as may be done without omitting anything vital to the case. It is conceivable that you may even have read some account of the matter. It is the supposed murder of Colonel Barclay of the Royal Munsters at Aldershot which I am investigating. I've heard nothing of it. It has not excited much attention yet, except locally. The facts are only two days old. Briefly, they are these. The Royal Munsters is, as you know, one of the most famous Irish regiments in the British Army. It did wonders both in the Crimea and the Mutiny, and has since that time distinguished itself upon every possible occasion. It was commanded up to Monday night by James Barclay, a gallant veteran, who started as a full private, was raised to commissioned rank for his bravery at the time of the mutiny, and so lived to command the regiment in which he had once carried a musket. 
Colonel Barclay had married at the time when he was a sergeant, and his wife, whose maiden name was Miss Nancy Devoy, was the daughter of a former color sergeant in the same corps. There was, therefore, as can be imagined, some little social friction when the young couple, for they were still young, found themselves in their new surroundings. They appear, however, to have quickly adapted themselves, and Mrs. Barclay has always, I understand, been as popular with the ladies of the regiment as her husband was with his brother officers. I may add that she was a woman of great beauty, and that even now, when she has been married for upwards of thirty years, she is still of a striking and queenly appearance. Colonel Barclay's family life appears to have been a uniformly happy one. Major Murphy, to whom I owe most of my facts, assures me that he has never heard of any misunderstanding between the pair. On the whole, he thinks that Barclay's devotion to his wife was greater than his wife's to Barclay. He was acutely uneasy if he were absent from her for a day. She, on the other hand, though devoted and beautiful, was less obtrusively affectionate. But they were regarded in the regiment as the very model of a middle-aged couple. There was absolutely nothing in their mutual relations to prepare people for the tragedy which was to follow. Colonel Barclay himself seems to have had some singular traits in his character. He was a dashing, jovial old soldier in his usual mood, but there were occasions on which he seemed to show himself capable of considerable violence and vindictiveness. The side of his nature, however, appears never to have been turned towards his wife. Another fact which had struck Major Murphy, and three out of five of the other officers with whom I conversed, was the singular sort of depression which came upon him at times. As the Major expressed it, the smile had often been struck from his mouth, as if by some invisible hand when he had been joining the gaieties and chaff of the mess-table. For days on end, when the mood was on him, he has been sunk in the deepest gloom. This and a certain tinge of superstition were the only usual traits in his character which his brother officers had observed. The latter peculiarity took the form of a dislike to being left alone, especially after dark. This puerile feature in a nature which was conspicuously manly had often given rise to comment and conjecture. The first battalion of the Royal Munsters, which is the old 117th, has been stationed at Aldershot for some years. The married officers live out of barracks, and the colonel has during all this time occupied a villa called Lachine, about half a mile from the north camp. The house stands in its own grounds, but the west side of it is not more than thirty yards from the high road. A coachman and two maids form the staff of servants. These with their master and mistress were the sole occupants of Lachine, for the Barclays had no children, nor was it usual for them to have resident visitors. Now for the events at Lachine between nine and ten on the evening of last Monday. Mrs. Barclay was, it appears, a member of the Roman Catholic Church, and had interested herself very much in the establishment of the Guild of St. George, which was formed in connection with the Wall Street Chapel for the purpose of supplying the poor with cast-off clothing. A meeting of the Guild had been held that evening at eight, and Mrs. Barclay had hurried over her dinner in order to be present at it. When leaving the house, she was heard by the coachman to make some commonplace remark to her husband, and to assure him that she would be back before very long. She then called for Miss Morrison, a young lady who lives in the next villa, and the two went off together to their meeting. It lasted forty minutes, and at a quarter past nine Mrs. Barclay returned home, having left Miss Morrison at her door as she passed. There is a room which is used as a morning room at Lachine. This faces the road and opens by a large glass-folding door onto the lawn. The lawn is thirty yards across and is only divided from the highway by a low wall with an iron rail above it. It was into this room that Mrs. Barclay went upon her return. The blinds were not down, for the room was seldom used in the evening, but Mrs. Barclay herself lit the lamp and then rang the bell, asking Jane Stewart, the housemaid, to bring her a cup of tea, which was quite contrary to her usual habits. The colonel had been sitting in the dining-room, but hearing that his wife had returned, he joined her in the morning-room. The coachman saw him cross the hall and enter it. He was never seen again alive. The tea which had been ordered was brought up at the end of ten minutes, but the maid, as she approached the door, was surprised to hear the voices of her master and mistress in furious altercation. She knocked without receiving any answer, and even turned the handle, but only to find that the door was locked upon the inside. Naturally enough, she ran down to tell the cook, and the two women with the coachman came up into the hall and listened to the dispute which was still raging. They all agreed that only two voices were to be heard, those of Barclay and of his wife. Barclay's remarks were subdued and abrupt, 
so that none of them were audible to the listeners. The ladies, on the other hand, were most bitter, and when she raised her voice could be plainly heard. "'You coward!' she repeated over and over. "'What can be done now? What can be done now? Give me back my life. I will never so much as breathe the same air with you again. You coward! You coward!' Those were scraps of her conversation, ending in a sudden dreadful cry in the man's voice, with a crash and a piercing scream from the woman. Convinced that some tragedy had occurred, the coachman rushed to the door and strove to force it, while scream after scream issued from within. He was unable, however, to make his way in, and the maids were too distracted with fear to be of any assistance to him. A sudden thought struck him, however, and he ran through the hall door and round to the lawn upon which the long French windows open. One side of the window was open, which I understand was quite usual in the summer time, and he passed without difficulty into the room. His mistress had ceased to scream, and was stretched insensible upon a couch, while with his feet tilted over the side of an armchair, and his head upon the ground, near the corner of the fender, was lying the unfortunate soldier, stone dead in a pool of his own blood. Naturally, the coachman's first thought, on finding that he could do nothing for his master, was to open the door but here an unexpected and singular difficulty presented itself. The key was not in the inner side of the door, nor could he find it anywhere in the room. He went out again, therefore, through the window, and having obtained the help of a policeman and of a medical man, he returned. The lady, against whom naturally the strongest suspicion rested, was removed to a room, still in a state of insensibility. The colonel's body was then placed upon the sofa, and a careful examination made of the scene of the tragedy. The injury from which the unfortunate veteran was suffering was found to be a jagged cut some two inches long at the back part of his head, which had evidently been caused by a violent blow from a blunt weapon. Nor was it difficult to guess what that weapon may have been. Upon the floor close to the body was lying a singular club of hard carved wood with a bone handle. The colonel possessed a varied collection of weapons brought from the different countries in which he had fought, and it is conjectured by the police that his club was among his trophies. The servants deny having seen it before, but among the numerous curiosities in the house it is possible that it may have been overlooked. Nothing else of importance was discovered in the room by the police, save the inexplicable fact that neither upon Mrs. Barclay's person, nor upon that of the victim, nor in any part of the room, was the missing key to be found. The door had eventually to be opened by a locksmith from Aldershot. That was the state of things, Watson, when upon the Tuesday morning I, at the request of Major Murphy, went down to Aldershot to supplement the efforts to the police. I think that you will acknowledge that the problem was already one of interest, but my observations soon made me realize that it was in truth much more extraordinary than would at first sight appear. Before examining the room I cross-questioned the servants, but only succeeded in eliciting the facts which I have already stated. One other detail of interest was remembered by Jane Stewart the housemaid. You will remember that on hearing the sound of the quarrel she descended and returned with the other servants. On that first occasion when she was alone she says that the voices of her master and mistress were sunk so low that she could hear hardly anything, and judged by their tones rather than their words, that they had fallen out. On my pressing her, however, she remembered that she heard the word David uttered twice by the lady. The point is of the utmost importance as guiding us towards the reason of the sudden quarrel. The colonel's name, you remember, was James. There was one thing in the case which had made the deepest impression both upon the servants and the police. This was the contortion of the colonel's face. It had set, according to their account, into the most dreadful expression of fear and horror which a human countenance is capable of assuming. More than one person fainted at the mere sight of him, so terrible was the effect. It was quite certain that he had foreseen his fate, and that it had caused him the utmost horror. This, of course, fitted in well enough with the police theory, if the colonel would have seen his wife making a murderous attack upon him. Nor was the fact of the wound being on the back of his head a fatal objection to this, as he might have turned to avoid the blow. No information could be got from the lady herself, who was temporarily insane from an acute attack of brain fever. From the police, I learned that Miss Morrison, who you remember, went out that evening with Mrs. Barclay, denied having any knowledge of what it was which had caused the ill-humour in which her companion had returned. Having gathered these facts, Watson, I smoked several pipes over them, trying to separate those which were crucial from others which were merely incidental. There could be no question that the most distinctive and suggestive point in the case was the singular disappearance of the door-key. 
A most careful search had failed to discover it in the room, therefore it must have been taken from it. But neither the colonel nor the colonel's wife could have taken it. That was perfectly clear. Therefore a third person must have entered the room, and that third person could only have come in through the window. It seemed to me that a careful examination of the room and the lawn might possibly reveal some traces of this mysterious individual. You know my methods, Watson. There was not one of them which I did not apply to the inquiry, and it ended by my discovering traces, but very different ones from those which I had expected. There had been a man in the room, and he had crossed the lawn coming from the road. I was able to obtain five very clear impressions of his footmarks, one in the roadway itself at the point where he had climbed the low wall, two on the lawn, and two very faint ones upon the stained boards near the window where he had entered. He had apparently rushed across the lawn, for his toe marks were much deeper than his heels, but it was not the man who surprised me. It was his companion. His companion? Holmes pulled a large sheet of tissue paper out of his pocket and carefully unfolded it upon his knee. "'What do you make of that?' he asked. The paper was covered with the tracings of the footmarks of some small animal. It had five well-marked footpads, an indication of long nails, and the whole print might be nearly as large as a dessert spoon. "'It's a dog,' said I. "'Did you ever hear of a dog running up a curtain? I found distinct traces that this creature had done so.' "'A monkey, then?' but it is not the print of a monkey. What can it be, then? Neither dog, nor cat, nor monkey, nor any creature that we are familiar with. I have tried to reconstruct it from the measurements. Here are four prints where the beast has been standing motionless. You see that it is no less than fifteen inches from forefoot to hind. Add to that the length of neck and head, and you get a creature not much less than two feet long. Probably more if there is any tail. But now observe this other measurement. The animal has been moving, and we have the length of its stride. In each case it is only about three inches. You have an indication, you see, of a long body with very short legs attached to it. It has not been considerate enough to leave any of its hair behind, but its general shape must be what I have indicated, and it can run up a curtain, and it is carnivorous. How do you deduce that? Because it ran up the curtain. A canary's cage was hanging in the window, and its aim seems to have been to get at the bird. Then what was the beast? Ah, if I could give it a name, it might go a long way towards solving the case. On the whole, it was probably some creature of the weasel and stoat tribe, and yet it is larger than any of these that I have seen. What had it to do with the crime? That is also still obscure, but we have learned a good deal, you perceive. We know that a man stood in the road looking at the quarrel between the Barclays. The blinds were up and the room lighted. We know also that he ran across the lawn, entered the room accompanied by a strange animal, and that he either struck the colonel, or, as is equally possible, that the colonel fell down from sheer fright at the sight of him, and cut his head on the corner of the fender. Finally, we have the curious fact that the intruder carried away the key with him when he left. "'Your discovery seem to have left the business more obscure than it was before,' said I. "'Quite so.' They undoubtedly showed that the affair was much deeper than was at first conjectured. I thought the matter over, and I came to the conclusion that I must approach the case from another aspect. But really, Watson, I am keeping you up, and I might just as well tell you all this on our way to Aldershot tomorrow. Thank you. You've gone rather too far to stop. It is quite certain that when Mrs. Barclay left the house at half-past seven she was on good terms with her husband. She was never, as I think I have said, ostentatiously affectionate but she was heard by the coachman chatting with the colonel in a friendly fashion. Now it was equally certain that, immediately on her return, she had gone to the room in which she was least likely to see her husband, had flown to tea as an agitated woman will, and finally, on his coming in to her, had broken into violent recriminations. Therefore something had occurred between seven-thirty and nine o'clock which had completely altered her feelings towards him. But Miss Morrison had been with her during the whole of that hour and a half. It was absolutely certain, therefore, in spite of her denial that she must know something of the matter. My first conjecture was that possibly there had been some passages between this young lady and the old soldier, which the former had now confessed to the wife. That would account for the angry return, and also for the girl's denial that anything had occurred. Nor would it be entirely incompatible with most of the words overheard. But there was the reference to David, and there was the known affection of the colonel for his wife to weigh against it to say nothing of the tragic intrusion of this other man, which might, of course, be entirely disconnected with what had gone before. 
It was not easy to pick one's steps, but on the whole I was inclined to dismiss the idea that there had been anything between the Colonel and Miss Morrison. But more than ever convinced that the young lady held the clue as to what it was which had turned Mrs. Barclay to hatred of her husband. I took the obvious course, therefore, of calling upon Miss M., of explaining to her that I was perfectly certain that she held the facts in her possession, and of assuring her that her friend, Mrs. Barclay, might find herself in the dock upon a capital charge, unless the matter were cleared up. Miss Morrison is a little ethereal slip of a girl, with timid eyes and blonde hair, but I found her by no means wanting in shrewdness and common sense. She sat thinking for some time after I had spoken, and then turning to me with a brisk air of resolution, she broke into a remarkable statement which I will condense for your benefit. "'I promised my friend that I would say nothing of the matter, and a promise is a promise,' said she. "'But if I can really help her when so serious a charge is laid against her, and when her own mouth, poor darling, is closed by illness, then I think I am absolved from my promise. I will tell you exactly what happened upon Monday evening. We were returning from the Watt Street Mission about a quarter to nine o'clock. On our way we had to pass through Hudson Street, which is a very quiet thoroughfare. There is only one lamp in it upon the left-hand side, and as we approached this lamp I saw a man coming towards us with his back very bent and something like a box slung over one of his shoulders. He appeared to be deformed, for he carried his head low and walked with his knees bent. We were passing him when he raised his face to look at us in the circle of light thrown by the lamp, and as he did so he stopped and screamed out in a dreadful voice, "'My God, it's Nancy!' Mrs. Barclay turned as white as death, and would have fallen down had the dreadful-looking creature not caught hold of her. I was going to call for the police, but she, to my surprise, spoke quite civilly to the fellow. "'I thought you had been dead this thirty years, Henry,' she said in a shaking voice. "'So I have,' said he, and it was awful to hear the tones that he said in it. He had a very dark, fearsome face, and the gleam in his eyes that comes back to me in my dreams. His hair and whiskers were shot with grey, and his face was all crinkled and puckered like a withered apple. "'Just walk on a little way, dear,' said Mrs. Barclay. "'I want to have a word with this man. "'There's nothing to be afraid of.' She tried to speak boldly, but she was still deadly pale and could hardly get her words out for the trembling of her lips. I did as she asked me, and they talked together for a few minutes. Then she came down the street with her eyes blazing, and I saw the crippled wretch standing by the lamp-post and shaking his clenched fists in the air, as if he were mad with rage. She never said a word until we were at the door here, when she took me by the hand and begged me to tell no one what had happened. "'It's an old acquaintance of mine, who has come down in the world,' said she. When I promised her I would say nothing, she kissed me, and I've never seen her since. I've told you now the whole truth, and if I withheld it from the police, it is because I did not realize then the danger in which my dear friend stood. I know that it can only be to her advantage that everything should be known. That was her statement, Watson, and to me, as you can imagine, it was like a light on a dark night. Everything which had been disconnected before began at once to assume its true place, and I had a shadowy presentiment of the whole sequence of events. My next step, obviously, was to find the man who had produced such a remarkable impression upon Mrs. Barclay. If he were still in Aldershot, it should not be a very difficult matter. There are not such a very great number of civilians, and a deformed man was sure to have attracted attention. I spent a day in the search, and by evening, this very evening, Watson, I had run him down. The man's name is Henry Wood, and he lives in lodgings in this same street in which the ladies met him. He has only been five days in the place. In the character of a registration agent, I had a most interesting gossip with his landlady. The man is by trade a conjurer and performer, going round the canteens after nightfall, and giving a little entertainment at each. He carries some creature about with him in that box, about which the landlady seemed to be in considerable trepidation, for she had never seen an animal like it. He uses it in some tricks according to her account, so much the woman was able to tell me, and also that it was a wonder the man lived, seeing how twisted he was and that he spoke in a strange tongue sometimes, and that for the last two nights she had heard him groaning and weeping in his bedroom. He was all right as far as money went, but in his deposit he had given her what looked like a bad florin. She showed it to me, Watson, and it was an Indian rupee. So now, my dear fellow, you see exactly how we stand and why it is I want you. It is perfectly plain that after the ladies parted from this man he followed them at a distance, that he saw the quarrel between husband and wife through the window, that he rushed in, and that the creature which he carried in his box got loose, that is all very certain. But he is the only person in this world who can tell us exactly what happened in that room. And you intend to ask him? 
"'Most certainly, but in the presence of a witness.' "'And I am the witness.' "'If you will be so good. "'If he can clear the matter up, well and good. "'If he refuses, we have no alternative but to apply for a warrant. "'But how do you know he'll be there when we return? "'You may be sure that I took some precautions. "'I have one of my Baker Street boys mounting guard over him "'who would stick to him like a burr, go where he might.' We shall find him in Hudson Street tomorrow, Watson, and meanwhile I should be the criminal myself if I kept you out of bed any longer. It was midday when we found ourselves at the scene of the tragedy, and under my companion's guidance we made our way at once to Hudson Street. In spite of his capacity for concealing his emotions, I could easily see that Holmes was in a state of suppressed excitement, while I was myself tingling with that half-sporting, half-intellectual pleasure which I invariably experienced when I associated myself with him in his investigations. "'This is the street,' said he, as we turned into a short thoroughfare lined with plain two-storied brick houses. "'Ah, here is Simpson to report.' "'He's in all right, Mr. Holmes,' cried a small street Arab running up to us. "'Good, Simpson,' said Holmes, patting him on the head. "'Come along, Watson, this is the house.' He sent in his card with a message that he had come on important business, and a moment later we were face to face with the man whom we had come to see. In spite of the warm weather, he was crouching over a fire, and the little room was like an oven. The man sat all twisted and huddled in his chair, in a way which gave an indescribable impression of deformity. But the face which he turned towards us, though worn and swarthy, must at some time have been remarkable for its beauty. He looked suspiciously at us now out of yellow-shot bilious eyes, and without speaking or rising, he waved towards two chairs. "'Mr. Henry Wood, late of India, I believe,' said Holmes affably. "'I've come over this little matter of Colonel Barclay's death.' "'What should I know about that?' "'That's what I want to ascertain. You know, I suppose, that unless the matter is cleared up, Mrs. Barclay, who is an old friend of yours, will in all probability be tried for murder.' The man gave a violent start. "'I don't know who you are,' he cried nor how you come to know what you do know. But will you swear that this is true that you tell me? Why, they're only waiting for her to come to her senses to arrest her. My God! Are you in the police yourself? No. What business is it of yours, then? It's every man's business to see justice done. You can take my word that she is innocent. Then you are guilty. No, I'm not. Who killed Colonel James Barclay, then? It was a just providence that killed him. But mind you this, that if I had knocked his brains out, as it was in my heart to do, he would have had no more than his due from my hands. If his own guilty conscience had not struck him down, it is likely enough that I might have had his blood upon my soul. You want me to tell the story? Well, I don't know why I shouldn't, for there's no cause for me to be ashamed of it. It was in this way, sir. You see me now with my back like a camel and my ribs all awry, but there was a time when Corporal Henry Wood was the smartest man in the 117th foot. We were in India then, in cantonments at a place we'll call Bertie. Barclay, who died the other day, was sergeant in the same company as myself, and the belle of the regiment, I and the finest girl that ever had the breath of life between her lips, was Nancy Devoy, the daughter of the colour sergeant. There were two men that loved her, and one that she loved, and you'll smile when you look at this poor thing huddled before the fire, and hear me say that it was for my good looks that she loved me. Well, though I had her heart, her father was set upon her marrying Barclay. I was a harum scarum reckless lad, and he had had an education, and was already marked for the sword-belt. But the girl held true to me, and it seemed that I would have had her when the mutiny broke out, and all hell was loose in the country. We were shut up in Bertie, the regiment of us, with half a battery of artillery, a company of six, and a lot of civilians and women-folk. There were ten thousand rebels round us, and they were as keen as a set of terriers round a rat-cage. About the second week of it our water gave out, and it was a question whether we could communicate with General Neal's column, which was moving up country. It was our only chance, for we could not hope to fight our way out with all the women and children, so I volunteered to go out and to warn General Neal of our danger. My offer was accepted, and I talked it over with Sergeant Barclay, who was supposed to know the ground better than any other man, and who drew up a route by which I might get through the rebel lines. At ten o'clock the same night I started off upon my journey. There were a thousand lives to save— but it was of only one that I was thinking when I dropped over the wall that night. My way ran down a dried-up watercourse, which we hoped would screen me from the enemy sentries, but as I crept round the corner of it I walked right into six of them, who were crouching down in the dark waiting for me. In an instant I was stunned with a blow and bound hand and foot, 
but the real blow was to my heart and not to my head, for as I came to and listened to as much as I could understand of their talk, I heard enough to tell me that my comrade, the very man who had arranged the way that I was to take, had betrayed me by means of a native servant into the hands of the enemy. Well, there's no need for me to dwell on that part of it. You know now what James Barclay was capable of. Bertie was relieved by Neil next day, but the rebels took me away with them in their retreat, and it was many a long year before ever I saw a white face again. I was tortured and tried to get away, and was captured and tortured again. You can see for yourselves the state in which I was left. Some of them that fled into Nepal took me with them, and then afterwards I was up past Darjeelin. The hill folk up there murdered the rebels who had me, and I became their slave for a time until I escaped. But instead of going south, I had to go north, until I found myself among the Afghans. There I wandered about for many a year, and at last came back to the Punjab, where I lived mostly among the natives and picked up a living by the conjuring tricks that I had learned. What use was it for me, a wretched cripple, to go back to England or to make myself known to my old comrades? Even my wish for revenge would not make me do that. I'd rather that Nancy and my old pals should think of Harry Wood as having died with a straight back than see him living and crawling with a stick like a chimpanzee. They never doubted that I was dead, and I meant that they never should. I heard that Barclay had married Nancy, and that he was raising rapidly in the regiment but even that did not make me speak. But when one gets old, one has a longing for home. For years I've been dreaming of the bright green fields and the hedges of England. At last I determined to see them before I died. I saved enough to bring me across, and then I came here where the soldiers are, for I know their ways and how to amuse them, and so earned enough to keep me. Your narrative is most interesting, said Sherlock Holmes. I've already heard of your meeting with Mrs. Barclay and your mutual recognition, you then, as I understand, followed her home, and saw through the window an altercation between her husband and her, in which she doubtless cast his conduct to you in his teeth. Your own feelings overcame you, and you ran across the lawn and broke in upon them. I did, sir, and at the sight of me he looked as I had never seen a man look before, and over he went with his head on the fender. But he was dead before he fell. I read death on his face as plain as I can read that text over the fire. The bare sight of me was like a bullet through his guilty heart. And then? Then Nancy fainted, and I caught up the key of the door from her hand, intending to unlock it and get help, but as I was doing it, it seemed to me better to leave it alone and get away, for the thing might look black against me, and anyway my secret would be out if I were taken. In my haste I thrust the key into my pocket, and dropped my stick while I was chasing Teddy who had run up the curtain. When I'd got him into his box from which he had slipped, I was off as fast as I could run. "'Who's Teddy?' asked Holmes. The man leaned over and pulled up the front of a kind of hutch in the corner. In an instant out there slipped a beautiful reddish-brown creature, thin and lithe, with the legs of a stoat, a long thin nose, and a pair of the finest red eyes that ever I saw in an animal's head. "'It's a mongoose!' I cried. "'Well, some call them that, and some call them Inchnaman,' said the man. "'Snake-catcher is what I call them, and Teddy is amazing quick on cobras. I have one here without the fangs, and Teddy catches it every night to please the folk in the canteen.' "'Any other point, sir?' "'Well, we may have to apply to you again if Mrs. Barclay should prove to be in serious trouble. "'In that case, of course, I'd come forward. "'But if not, there is no object in raking up this scandal against a dead man, foully as he has acted. "'You have at least the satisfaction of knowing that for thirty years of his life "'his conscience bitterly reproached him for this wicked deed. "'Ah, there goes Major Murphy on the other side of the street. "'Good-bye, Wood. I want to learn if anything has happened since yesterday.' We were in time to overtake the Major before he reached the corner. "'Ah, Holmes,' he said, "'I suppose you have heard that all this fuss has come to nothing.' "'What, then?' "'The inquest is just over. The medical evidence showed conclusively that death was due to apoplexy. You see, it was quite a simple case after all.' "'Oh, remarkably superficial,' said Holmes, smiling. "'Come, Watson, I don't think we shall be wanted in Aldershot any more.' "'There's one thing,' said I, as we walked down to the station.' If the husband's name was James, and the other was Henry, what was this talk about David? That one word, my dear Watson, should have told me the whole story had I been the ideal reasoner which you are so fond of depicting. It was evidently a term of reproach. Of reproach? Yes. David strayed a little occasionally, you know, and on one occasion in the same direction as Sergeant James Barclay. You remember the small affair of Uriah and Bathsheba? My biblical knowledge is a trifle rusty, I fear, but you'll find the story in the first or second of Samuel.
adventure of the six napoleons by sir arthur conan doyle it was no very unusual thing for mr lestrade of scotland yard to look in upon us of an evening and his visits were welcome to sherlock holmes for they enabled him to keep in touch with all that was going on at the police headquarters in return for the news which lestrade would bring holmes was always ready to listen with attention to the details of any case upon which the detective was engaged and was able occasionally without any active interference to give some hint or suggestion drawn from his own vast knowledge and experience on this particular evening lestrade had spoken of the weather and the newspapers then he had fallen silent puffing thoughtfully at his cigar holmes looked keenly at him anything remarkable on hand he asked oh no mr holmes nothing very particular then tell me about it lestrade laughed well mr holmes there is no use denying that there is something on my mind and yet it is such an absurd business that i hesitated to bother you about it on the other hand although it is trivial it is undoubtedly queer and i know that you have a taste for all that is out of the common but in my opinion it comes more in dr watson's line than ours disease said i madness anyhow and a queer madness too you wouldn't think there was anyone living at this time of day who was such a hatred of napoleon the first that he would break any image of him that he could see holmes sank back in his chair that's no business of mine said he exactly that's what i said but then when the man commits burglary in order to break images which are not his own that brings it away from the doctor and on to the policeman holmes sat up again burglary this is more interesting let me hear the details lestrade took out his official notebook and refreshed his memory from its pages the first case reported was four days ago said he it was at the shop of morse hudson it was a place for the sale of pictures and statues in the kennington road the assistant had left the front shop for an instant when he heard a crash and hurrying in he found a plaster bust of napoleon which stood with several other works of art upon the counter lying shivered into fragments he rushed out into the road but although several passers-by declared that they had noticed a man run out of the shop he could neither see anyone nor could he find any means of identifying the rascal it seemed to be one of those senseless acts of hooliganism which occur from time to time and it was reported to the constable on the beat as such the plaster cast was not worth more than a few shillings and the whole affair appeared to be too childish for any particular investigation the second case however was more serious and also more singular it occurred only last night in kennington road and within a few hundred yards of morse hudson's shop there lives a well-known medical practitioner named dr barnicott who is one of the largest practices upon the south side of the thames his residence and principal consulting room is at kennington road but he has a branch surgery and dispensary at lower brixton road two miles away this dr barnicott is an enthusiastic admirer of napoleon and his house is full of books pictures and relics of the french emperor some little time ago he purchased from morse hudson two duplicate plaster casts of the famous head of napoleon by the french sculptor devine one of these he placed in his hall in the house at kennington road and the other on the mantelpiece of the surgery at lower brixton well when dr barnicott came down this morning he was astonished to find that his house had been burgled during the night but that nothing had been taken save the plaster head from the hall it had been carried out and had been dashed savagely against the garden wall under which its splintered fragments were discovered holmes rubbed his hands this is certainly very novel said he i thought it would please you but i have not got to the end yet dr barnicot was due at his surgery at twelve o'clock and you can imagine his amazement when on arriving there he found that the window had been opened in the night and that the broken pieces of his second bust were strewn all over the room it had been smashed to atoms where it stood 
in neither case were there any signs which could give us a clue as to the criminal or lunatic who'd done the mischief now mr holmes you've got the facts they are singular not to say grotesque said holmes may i ask whether the two busts smashed in dr barnicot's rooms were the exact duplicates of the one which was destroyed in morse hudson's shop they were taken from the same mould such a fact must tell against the theory that the man who breaks them is influenced by any general hatred of napoleon considering how many hundreds of statues of the great emperor must exist in london it is too much to suppose such a coincidence as that a promiscuous iconoclast should chance to begin upon three specimens of the same bust well i thought as you do said lestrade on the other hand this morse hudson is the purveyor of busts in that part of london and these three were the only ones which have been in his shop for years so although as you say there are many hundreds of statues in london it is very probable that these three were the only ones in that district therefore a local fanatic would begin with them what do you think dr watson there are no limits to the possibilities of monomania i answered there is the condition which the modern french psychologists have called the idee fixe which may be trifling in character and accompanied by complete sanity in every other way a man who had read deeply about napoleon or who had possibly received some hereditary family injury through the great war might conceivably form such an idee fixe and under its influence be capable of any fantastic outrage that won't do my dear watson said holmes shaking his head for no amount of idee fixe would enable your interesting monomaniac to find out where these busts were situated well how do you explain it i don't attempt to do so i would only observe that there is a certain method in the gentleman's eccentric proceedings for example in dr barnicot's hall where a sound might arouse the family the bust was taken outside before being broken whereas in the surgery where there are less danger of an alarm it was smashed where it stood the affair seems absurdly trifling and yet i dare call nothing trivial when i reflect that some of my most classic cases have had the least promising commencement you will remember watson how the dreadful business of the abernetti family was first brought to my notice by the depth which the parsley had sunk into the butter upon a hot day i cannot afford therefore to smile at your three broken busts lestrade and i shall be very much obliged to you if you will let me hear of any fresh developments of so singular a chain of events the development for which my friend had asked came in a quicker and an infinitely more tragic form than he could have imagined i was still dressing in my bedroom next morning when there was a tap at the door and holmes entered a telegram in his hand he read it aloud come instantly 131 pitt street kensington lestrade what is it then i asked don't know maybe anything but i suspect it is the sequel of the story of the statues in that case our friend the image breaker has begun operations in another quarter of london there's coffee on the table watson and i have a cab at the door in half an hour we had reached pitt street a quiet little backwater just beside one of the briskest currents of london life number one thirty one was one of a row all flat-chested respectable and most unromantic dwellings as we drove up we found the railings in front of the house lined by a curious crowd holmes whistled by george it's attempted murder at the least nothing less will hold the london message boy there's a deed of violence indicated in that fellow's round shoulders and outstretched neck what's this watson the top steps swill down and the other ones dry footsteps enough anyhow well well there's lestrade at the front window and we shall soon know all about it the official received us with a very grave face and showed us into a sitting-room where an exceedingly unkempt and agitated elderly man clad in a flannel dressing-gown was pacing up and down 
he was introduced to us as the owner of the house mr horace harker of the central press syndicate it's the napoleon bus business again said lestrade you seemed interested last night mr holmes so i thought perhaps you would be glad to be present now that the affair has taken a very much graver turn what has it turned to then to murder mr harker will you tell these gentlemen exactly what has occurred the man in the dressing-gown turned upon us with a most melancholy face it's an extraordinary thing said he that all my life i have been collecting other people's news and now that a real piece of news has come my own way i am so confused and bothered that i can't put two words together if i had come in here as a journalist i should have interviewed myself and had two columns in every evening paper as it is i am giving away valuable copy by telling my story over and over to a string of different people and i can make no use of it myself however i have heard your name mr sherlock holmes and if you'll only explain this queer business i shall be paid for my trouble in telling you the story holmes sat down and listened it all seems to centre around that bust of napoleon which i bought for this very room about four months ago i picked it up cheap from harding brothers two doors from the high street station a great deal of my journalistic work is done at night and i often write until the early morning so it was to-day i was sitting in my den which is at the back of the top of the house about three o'clock when i was convinced that i heard some sounds downstairs i listened but they were not repeated and i concluded that they came from outside then suddenly about five minutes later there came a most horrible yell the most dreadful sound mr holmes that ever i heard it will ring in my ears as long as i live i sat frozen with horror for a minute or two and then i seized the poker and went downstairs when i entered this room i found the window wide open and i at once observed that the bust was gone from the mantelpiece why any burglar should take such a thing passes my understanding for it was only a plaster cast and of no real value whatever you can see for yourself that anyone going out through that open window could reach the front doorstep by taking a long stride this was clearly what the burglar had done so i went round and opened the door stepping out into the dark i nearly fell over a dead man who was lying there i ran back for a light and there was a poor fellow a great gash in his throat and the whole place swimming in blood he lay on his back his knees drawn up and his mouth horribly open i shall see him in my dreams i had just time to blow on my police whistle and then i must have fainted for i knew nothing more until i found the policeman standing over me in the hall well who was the murdered man asked holmes there's nothing to show who he was said lestrade you shall see the body at the mortuary but we've made nothing of it up to now he is a tall man sunburned very powerful not more than three he's poorly dressed and yet does not appear to be a labourer a horn handled clasp knife was lying in a pool of blood beside him whether it was the weapon which did the deed or whether it belonged to the dead man i do not know there was no name on his clothing and nothing in his pocket save an apple some string a shilling map of london and a photograph here it is it was evidently taken by a snapshot from a small camera it represented an alert sharp-featured simian man with thick eyebrows and a very peculiar projection of the lower part of the face like the muzzle of a baboon and what became of the bust asked holmes after a careful study of this picture we had news of it just before you came it has been found in the front garden of an empty house in camden house road it was broken into fragments i'm going round now to see it will you come certainly i must just take one look round he examined the carpet and the window the fellow had either very long legs or was a most active man said he with an area beneath 
it was no mean feat to reach that window ledge and open that window getting back was comparatively simple are you coming with us to see the remains of your bust mr harker the disconsolate journalist had seated himself at a writing table i must try and make something of it said he though i have no doubt that the first editions of the evening papers are out already with full details it's like my luck you remember when the stand fell at doncaster well i was the only journalist in the stand and my journal the only one that had no account of it for i was too shaken to write it and now i'll be too late with a murder done on my own doorstep as we left the room we heard his pen travelling shrilly over the fool's cap the spot where the fragments of the bust had been found was only a few hundred yards away for the first time our eyes rested upon this presentiment of the great emperor which seemed to raise such frantic and destructive hatred in the mind of the unknown it lay scattered in splintered shards upon the grass holmes picked up several of them and examined them carefully i was convinced from his intent face and his purposeful manner that at last he was upon a clue well asked lestrade holmes shrugged his shoulders we have a long way to go yet said he and yet and yet well we have some suggestive facts to act upon the possession of this trifling bust was worth more in the eyes of this strange criminal than a human life that is one point then there is a singular fact that he did not break it in the house or immediately outside the house if to break it was his sole object he was rattled and bustled by meeting this other fellow he hardly knew what he was doing well that's likely enough but i wish to call your attention very particularly to the position of this house in the garden of which the bust was destroyed lestrade looked about him it was an empty house and so he knew that he would not be disturbed in the garden yes but there is another empty house farther up the street which he must have passed before he came to this one why did he not break it there since it is evident that every yard that he carried it increased the risk of some one meeting him i'll give it up said lestrade holmes pointed to the street lamp above our heads he could see what he was doing here and he could not there that was his reason by jove that's true said the detective now that i come to think of it dr barnicot's bust was broken not far from his red lamp well mr holmes what are we to do with that fact to remember it to docket it we may come on something later which will bear upon it what steps do you propose to take now lestrade the most practical way of getting at it in my opinion is to identify the dead man there should be no difficulty about that when we've found who he is and who his associates are we should have a good start in learning what he was doing in pitt street last night and who it was who met him and killed him on the doorstep of mr horace harker don't you think so no doubt and yet it is not quite the way in which i should approach the case what would you do then oh you must not let me influence you in any way i suggest that you go on your line and i on mine we can compare notes afterwards and each will supplement the other very good said lestrade if you are going back to pitt street you might see mr horace harker tell him from me that i have quite made up my mind and that it is certain that a dangerous homicidal lunatic with napoleonic delusions was in his house last night it will be useful for his article lestrade stared you don't seriously believe that holmes smiled don't i well perhaps i don't but i'm sure that it will interest mr horace harker and the subscribers of the central press syndicate now watson i think that we shall find that we have a long and rather complex day's work before us i should be glad lestrade if you could make it convenient to meet us at baker street at six o'clock this evening until then i should like to keep this photograph found in the dead man's pocket it is possible that i may have to ask your company and assistance upon a small expedition which will have be undertaken to-night 
if my chain of reasoning should prove to be correct until then good-bye and good luck sherlock holmes and i walked together to the high street where we stopped at the shop of harding brothers whence the bust had been purchased a young assistant informed us that mr harding would be absent until afternoon and that he was himself a newcomer who could give us no information holmes's face showed his disappointment and annoyance well well we can't expect to have it all our own way watson he said at last we must come back in the afternoon if mr harding will not be here until then i am as you have no doubt surmised endeavouring to trace these busts to their source in order to find if there is not something peculiar which may account for their remarkable fate let us make for mr morse hudson of the kennington road and see if he can throw any light upon the problem a drive of an hour brought us to the picture dealer's establishment he was a small stout man with a red face and a peppery manner yes sir on my very counter sir said he what we pay rates and taxes for i don't know when any ruffian can come in and break one's goods yes sir it was i who sold dr parnicott his two statues disgraceful sir a nihilist plot that's what i make it no one but an anarchist could go about breaking statues red republicans that's what i call them who did i get the statues from i don't see what that got to do with it well if you really want to know i got them from gelder and company in church street stepney they're a well-known house in the trade and have been this twenty years how many had i three two and one or three two of dr barnicott's and one smashed in broad daylight on my own counter do i know that photograph no i don't yes i do though why it's beppo he was a kind of italian piecework man who made himself useful in the shop he could carve a bit and gild and frame and do odd jobs the fellow left me last week and i've heard nothing of him since no i don't know where he came from nor where he went to i had nothing against him while he was here he was gone two days before the bust was smashed well that's all we could reasonably expect from morse hudson said holmes as we emerged from the shop we have this beppo as a common factor both in kennington and in kensington so that is worth a ten-mile drive now watson let us make for gelder and company of stepney the source and origin of the busts i shall be surprised if we don't get some help down there in rapid succession we pass through the fringe of fashionable london hotel london theatrical london literary london commercial london and finally maritime london till we came to a riverside city of a hundred thousand souls where the tenement houses swelter and reek with the outcasts of europe here in a broad thoroughfare once the abode of wealthy city merchants we found the sculpture works for which we searched outside was a considerable yard full of monumental masonry inside was a large room in which fifty workers were carving or moulding the manager a big blond german received us civilly and gave a clear answer to all holmes's questions a reference to his books showed that hundreds of casts had been taken from a marble copy of devine's head of napoleon but that the three which had been sent to morse hudson a year or so before had been half of a batch of six the other three being sent to harding brothers of kensington there was no reason why those six should be different from any of the other casts he could suggest no possible cause why anyone should wish to destroy them in fact he laughed at the idea their wholesale price was six shillings but the retailer would get twelve or more the cast was taken in two moulds from each side of the face and then these two profiles of plaster of paris were joined together to make the complete bust the work was usually done by italians in the room we were in when finished the busts were put on a table in the passage to dry and afterwards stored that was all he could tell us but the production of the photograph had a remarkable effect upon the manager his face flushed with anger and his brows knotted over his blue teutonic eyes ah the rascal he cried yes indeed i know him very well this has been also a respectable establishment 
and the only time that we have ever had the police in it was over this very fellow it was more than a year ago now he knifed another italian in the street and then he came to the works with the police on his heels and he was taken here beppo was his name his second name i never knew serve me right for engaging a man with such a face but he was a good workman one of the best what did he get the man lived and he got off with a year i have no doubt he is out now but he has not dared to show his nose here we have a cousin of his here and i dare say he could tell you where he is no no cried holmes not a word to the cousin not a word i beg of you the matter is very important and the farther i go with it the more important it seems to grow when you referred in your ledger to the sale of those casts i observed that the date was june third of last year could you give me the date when beppo was arrested i could tell you roughly by the pay list the manager answered yes he continued after some turning over of the pages he was paid last on may twentieth thank you said holmes i don't think that i need intrude upon your time and patience any more with a last word of caution that he should say nothing as to our researches we turned our faces westward once more the afternoon was far advanced before we were able to snatch a hasty luncheon at a restaurant a news bill at the entrance announced kensington outrage murder by a madman and the contents of the paper showed that mr horace harker had got his account into print after all two columns were occupied with a highly sensational and flowery rendering of the whole incident holmes propped it against the cruet stand and read it while he ate once or twice he chuckled this is all right watson said he listen to this it is satisfactory to know that there can be no difference of opinion upon this case since mr lestrade one of the most experienced members of the official force and mr sherlock holmes the well-known consulting expert have each come to the conclusion that the grotesque series of incidents which have ended in so tragic a fashion arise from lunacy rather than from deliberate crime no explanation save mental aberration can cover the facts the press watson is a most valuable institution if you only know how to use it and now if you have quite finished we will hark back to kensington and see what the manager of harding brothers has to say on the matter the founder of that great emporium proved to be a brisk crisp little person very dapper and quick with a clear head and a ready tongue yes sir i have already read the account in the evening papers mr horace harker is a customer of ours we supplied him with the bust some months ago we ordered three busts of that sort from gelder and company of stepney they are all sold now to whom oh i dare say by consulting our sales book we could very easily tell you yes we have the entries here one to mr harker you see and one to mr josiah brown of laburnum lodge laburnum vale chiswick and one to mr sandiford of lower grove road reading no i have never seen this face which you show me in the photograph you would hardly forget it would you sir for i have seldom seen an uglier have we any italians on the staff yes sir we have several among our workpeople and the cleaners i dare say they might get a peep at that sales book if they wanted to there is no particular reason for keeping a watch upon that book well well it's a very strange business and i hope that you will let me know if anything comes of your inquiries holmes had taken several notes during mr harding's evidence and i could see that he was thoroughly satisfied by the turn which affairs were taking he made no remark however say that unless we hurried we should be late for our appointment with lestrade sure enough when we reached baker street the detective was already there and we found him pacing up and down in a fever of impatience this look of importance showed that his day's work had not been in vain well he asked what luck mr holmes we have had a very busy day and not entirely a wasted one my friend explained we have seen both the retailers and also the wholesale manufacturers i can trace each of the busts now from the beginning the busts cried lestrade 
well well you have your own methods mr sherlock holmes and it's not for me to say a word against them but i think i've done a better day's work than you i have identified the dead man you don't say so and found a cause for the crime splendid we have an inspector who makes a specialty of saffron hill and the italian quarter well this dead man had some catholic emblem round his neck and that along with his colour made me think he was from the south inspector hill knew him the moment he caught sight of him his name is pietro venucci from naples and he's one of the greatest cutthroats in london he is connected with the mafia which as you know is a secret political society enforcing its decrees by murder now you see how the affair begins to clear up the other fellow is probably an italian also and a member of the mafia he's broken the rules in some fashion pietro is set upon his track probably the photograph we found in his pocket is the man himself so that he may not knife the wrong person he dogs the fellow he sees him enter a house he waits outside for him and in the scuffle he receives his own death wound how's that mr sherlock holmes holmes clapped his hands approvingly excellent lestrade excellent he cried but i didn't quite follow your explanation of the destruction of the busts the busts you never can get those busts out of your head after all that's nothing petty larceny six months at the most it is the murder that we're really investigating and i tell you that i'm gathering all the threads into my hands and the next stage is a very simple one i shall go down with ill to the italian quarter find the man whose photograph we've got and arrest him on the charge of murder will you come with us i think not i fancy we can attain our end in a simpler way i can't say for certain because it all depends well it all depends upon a factor which is completely outside our control but i have great hopes in fact the betting is exactly two to one that if you will come with us tonight i shall be able to help you to lay him by the heels in the italian corps no i fancy chiswick is an address which is more likely to find him if you will come with me to chiswick tonight lestrade i'll promise to go to the italian quarter with you tomorrow and no harm will be done by the delay and now i think that a few hours sleep would do us all good for i do not propose to leave before eleven o'clock and it is unlikely that we shall be back before morning you'll dine with us lestrade and then you are welcome to the sofa until it's time for us to start in the meantime watson i should be glad if you would ring for an express messenger for i have a letter to send and it is important that it should go at once holmes spent the evening in rummaging among the files of the old daily papers with which one of our lumber rooms was packed when at last he descended it was with triumph in his eyes but he said nothing to either of us as to the result of his researches for my own part i had followed step by step the methods by which he had traced the various windings of this complex case and though i could not yet perceive the goal which we would reach i understood clearly that holmes expected this grotesque criminal to make an attempt upon the two remaining busts one of which i remembered was at chiswick no doubt the object of our journey was to catch him in the very act and i could not but admire the cunning with which my friend had inserted a wrong clue in the evening paper so as to give the fellow the idea that he could continue his scheme with impunity i was not surprised when holmes suggested that i should take my revolver with me he had himself picked up the loaded hunting crop which was his favorite weapon a four-wheeler was at the door at eleven and in it we drove to a spot at the other side of hammersmith bridge here the cabman was directed to wait a short walk brought us to a secluded road fringed with pleasant houses each standing in its own grounds in the light of a street lamp we read laburnum villa upon the gatepost of one of them the occupants had evidently retired to rest for all was dark save for a fanlight over the hall door which shed a single blurred circle onto the garden path 
the wooden fence which separated the grounds from the road threw a dense black shadow upon that inner side and here it was that we crouched i fear that you'll have a long wait holmes whispered we may thank our stars that it is not raining i don't think we can even venture to smoke to pass the time however it's a two-to-one chance that we get something to pay us for our trouble it's proved however that our vigil was not to be so long as holmes had led us to fear and it ended in a very sudden and singular fashion in an instant without the least sound to warn us of his coming the garden gate swung open and a lithe dark figure as swift and active as an ape rushed up the garden path we saw it whisk past the light thrown from over the door and disappear against the black shadow of the house there was a long pause during which we held our breath and then a very gentle creaking sound came to our ears the window was being opened the noise ceased and again there was a long silence the fellow was making his way into the house we saw the sudden flash of a dark lantern inside the room what he sought was evidently not there for again we saw the flash through another blind and then through another let us go to the open window we'll nab him as he climbs out lestrade whispered but before we could move the man had emerged again as he came out into the glimmering patch of light we saw that he carried something white under his arm he looked stealthily all around him the silence of the deserted street reassured him turning his back upon us he laid down his burden and the next instant there was the sound of a sharp tap followed by a clatter and rattle the man was so intent upon what he was doing that he never heard our steps as we stole across the grass plot with the bound of a tiger holmes was on his back and an instant later lestrade and i had him by either wrist and the handcuffs had been fastened as we turned him over i saw a hideous sallow face with writhing furious features glaring up at us and i knew that it was indeed the man of the photograph whom we had secured but it was not our prisoner to whom holmes was giving his attention squatted on the doorstep he was engaged in most carefully examining that which the man had brought from the house it was a bust of napoleon like the one which we had seen that morning and it had been broken to similar fragments carefully holmes held each separate shard to the light but in no way did it differ from any other shattered piece of plaster he had just completed his examination when the hall lights flew up the door opened and the owner of the house a jovial rotund figure in shirt and trousers presented himself mr josiah brown i suppose said holmes yes sir and you no doubt are mr sherlock holmes i had the note which you sent by the express messenger and i did exactly what you told me we locked every door on the inside and awaited developments well i'm very glad to see that you have got the rascal i hope gentlemen that you will come in and have some refreshment however lestrade was anxious to get his man into safe quarters so within a few minutes our cab had been summoned and we were all four upon our way to london not a word would our captive say but he glared at us from the shadow of his matted hair and once when my hand seemed within his reach he snapped at it like a hungry wolf we stayed long enough at the police station to learn that a search of his clothing revealed nothing save a few shillings and a long sheath knife the handle of which bore copious traces of recent blood that's all right said lestrade as we parted he'll knows all these gentry and we'll give a name to him you'll find that my theory of the mafia will work out all right but i'm sure i'm exceedingly obliged to you mr holmes for the workmanlike way in which you've laid hands upon him i don't quite understand it all yet i fear it is rather too late an hour for explanations said holmes besides there are one or two details which are not finished off and it is one of those cases which are worth working out to the very end if you will come round once more to my rooms at six o'clock to-morrow i think i shall be able to show you that even now you have not grasped the entire meaning of this business which presents some features which make it absolutely original in the history of crime 
if ever i permit you to chronicle any more of my little problems watson i foresee that you will enliven your pages by an account of the singular adventure of the napoleonic busts when we met again next evening lestrade was furnished with much information concerning our prisoner his name it appeared was beppo second name unknown he was a well-known ne'er-do-well among the italian colony he had once been a skilful sculptor and had earned an honest living but he had taken to evil courses and had twice already been in jail once for a petty theft and once as we had already heard for stabbing a fellow countryman he could talk english perfectly well his reasons for destroying the busts were still unknown and he refused to answer any questions upon the subject but the police had discovered that these same busts might very well have been made by his own hands since he was engaged in this class of work at the establishment of gelder and company to all this information much of which we already knew holmes listened with polite attention but i who knew him so well could clearly see that his thoughts were elsewhere and i detected a mixture of mingled uneasiness and expectation beneath that mask which he was wont to assume at last he started in his chair and his eyes brightened there had been a ring at the bell a minute later we heard steps upon the stairs and an elderly red-faced man with grizzled side whiskers was ushered in in his right hand he carried an old-fashioned carpet bag which he placed upon the table is mr sherlock holmes here my friend bowed and smiled mr sandiford of reading i suppose said he yes sir i fear that i am a little late but the trains were awkward you wrote to me about a bust that is in my possession exactly i have your letter here you said i desire to possess a copy of devine's napoleon and am prepared to pay you ten pounds for the one which is in your possession is that right certainly i was very much surprised at your letter for i could not imagine how you knew that i owned such a thing of course you must have been surprised but the explanation is very simple mr harding of harding brothers said that they had sold you their last copy and he gave me your address oh that was it was it did he tell you what i paid for it no he did not well i am an honest man though not a very rich one i only gave fifteen shillings for the bust and i think you ought to know that before i take ten pounds from you i am sure the scruple does you honour mr sandiford but i have named that price so i intend to stick to it well it's very handsome of you mr holmes i bought the bust up with me as you asked me to do here it is he opened his bag and at last we saw placed upon our table a complete specimen of that bust which we had already seen more than once in fragments holmes took a paper from his pocket and laid a ten pound note upon the table you will kindly sign that paper mr sandiford in the presence of these witnesses it is simply to say that you transfer every possible right that you ever had in the bust to me i am a methodical man you see and you never know what turn events might take afterwards thank you mr sandiford here is your money and i wish you a very good evening when our visitor had disappeared sherlock holmes's movements were such as to rivet our attention he began by taking a clean white cloth from a drawer and laying it over the table then he placed his newly acquired bust in the centre of the cloth finally he picked up his hunting crop and struck napoleon a sharp blow on the top of the head the figure broke into fragments and holmes bent eagerly over the shattered remains next instant with a loud shout of triumph he held up one splinter in which a round dark object was fixed like a plum in a pudding gentlemen he cried let me introduce you to the famous black pearl of the borgias lestrade and i sat silent for a moment and then with a spontaneous impulse we both broke at clapping as at the well-wrought crisis of a play 
a flush of colour sprang to holmes's pale cheeks and he bowed to us like the master dramatist who receives the homage of his audience it was at such moments that for an instant he ceased to be a reasoning machine and betrayed his human love for admiration and applause the same singularly proud and reserved nature which turned away with disdain from popular notoriety was capable of being moved to its depths by spontaneous wonder and praise from a friend yes gentlemen said he it is the most famous pearl now existing in the world and it has been my good fortune by a connected chain of inductive reasoning to trace it from the prince of coloner's bedroom at the ducker hotel where it was lost to the interior of this the last of the six busts of napoleon which were manufactured by gelder and company of stepney you will remember lestrade the sensation caused by the disappearance of this valuable jewel and the vain efforts of the london police to recover it i was myself consulted upon the case but i was unable to throw any light upon it suspicion fell upon the maid of the princess who was an italian and it was proved that she had a brother in london but we failed to trace any connection between them the maid's name was lucretia venucci and there is no doubt in my mind that this pietro who was murdered two nights ago was the brother i have been looking up the dates in the old files of the paper and i find that the disappearance of the pearl was exactly two days before the arrest of beppo for some crime of violence an event which took place in the factory of gelder and company at the very moment when these busts were being made now you clearly see the sequence of events though you see them of course in the inverse order to the way in which they presented themselves to me beppo had the pearl in his possession he may have stolen it from pietro he may have been pietro's confederate he may have been the go-between of pietro and his sister it is of no consequence to us which is the correct solution the main fact is that he had the pearl and at that moment when it was on his person he was pursued by the police he made for the factory in which he worked and he knew that he had only a few minutes in which to conceal this enormously valuable prize which would otherwise be found on him when he was searched six plaster casts of napoleon were drying in the passage one of them was still soft in an instant beppo a skilful workman made a small hole in the wet plaster dropped in the pearl and with a few touches covered over the aperture once more it was an admirable hiding place no one could possibly find it but beppo was condemned to a year's imprisonment and in the meanwhile his six busts were scattered over london he could not tell which contained his treasure only by breaking them could he see even shaking would tell him nothing for as the plaster was wet it was probable that the pearl would adhere to it as in fact it has done beppo did not despair and he conducted his search with considerable ingenuity and perseverance through a cousin who works with gelder he found out the retail firms who had bought the busts he managed to find employment with morse hudson and in that way tracked down three of them the pearl was not there then with the help of some italian employee he succeeded in finding out where the other three busts had gone the first was at harker's there he was dogged by his confederate who held beppo responsible for the loss of the pearl and he stabbed him in the scuffle which followed if he was his confederate why should he carry his photograph i asked as a means of tracing him if he wished to inquire about him from any third person and that was the obvious reason well after the murder i calculated that beppo would probably hurry rather than delay his movements he would fear that the police would read his secret and so he hastened on before they could get ahead of him of course i could not say that he had not found the pearl in harker's bust i had not even concluded for certain that it was the pearl but it was evident to me that he was looking for something since he carried the bust past the other houses in order to break it in the garden which had a lamp overlooking it since harker's bust was one in three the chances were exactly as i told you two to one against the pearl being inside it 
there remained two busts and it was obvious that he would go for the london one first i warned the inmates of the house so as to avoid a second tragedy and we went down with the happiest results by that time of course i knew for certain that it was the borgia pearl that we were after the name of the murdered man linked the one event with the other there only remained a single bust the reading one and the pearl must be there i bought it in your presence from the owner and there it lies we sat in silence for a moment well said lestrade i've seen you handle a good many cases mr holmes but i don't know that i've ever no more workman like one than that we're not jealous of you at scotland yard no sir we are very proud of you and if you come down to-morrow there is not a man from the oldest inspector to the youngest constable who wouldn't be glad to shake you by the hand thank you said holmes thank you and as he turned away it seemed to me that he was more nearly moved by the softer human emotions than i had ever seen him a moment later he was the cold and practical thinker once more put the pearl in the safe watson said he and get out the papers of the conk singleton forgery case good-bye lestrade if any little problem comes your way i shall be happy if i can to give you a hint or two as to its solution if you like the video put a like subscribe to the channel and click on the bell to not miss our new videos